Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. For now, I'm going to hand over to Chandru, um, who's our wonderful speaker for today, who's going to be chatting to us about bioplastics and recycling. Thank you, Tara. Appreciate it. Good afternoon to everyone. Let me just fire up the merchandise. Voila. Can you see that? So um, biodegradable plastics, scourge or savior, both or neither. Um, let's see if we can add a little bit of clarity to what can be a bit of a confusing subject from time to time. I think a good starting point, it's uh, let's first clear the doubt. Uh, Bio-based and biodegradable are not the same thing. Um, I've been in many conversations where one person is referring to bio in the context of bio-based and those in the audience are hearing biodegradable. So really important uh, to use the terminology in its full context, uh, otherwise it can get very confusing. So the term bio-based refers to a material made uh, from feedstocks uh, that have come from renewable sources. Uh, examples include sugarcane, corn, cellulates, cellulose. Uh, biodegradable, on the other hand, refers to materials' ability to decompose uh, via microbial activity, uh, referring to the product's end of life. Uh, the process depends on the surrounding environmental conditions, on the material, and on the application. And this becomes important because a lot of claims of biodegradability uh, fall on the inability uh, to have the conditions it needs in certain regional contexts for that to happen. A combination of those properties can generate materials that can be classified into three main types. First one is fully or partially bio-based, but not biodegradable, e.g. bio-based PET. Uh, so you might have noticed the Valpre bottle is known as the plant bottle. Part of that is uh, made from bio-based raw material. Uh, but it's not biodegradable. You then have biodegradable, but petroleum-based, as in PCL. And finally, you have both fully and partially bio-based and biodegradable in terms of products like PLA. Uh, if that's not confusing enough, let's see if we can't confuse you a little more. So my perspective today is uh, from the cold face. It's a little different. I think a lot of the debate around subjects of bio-based and biodegradable are theoretical. They don't necessarily take context of where we live. Uh, and the African continent has some very unique challenges. Uh, so important that when we debate these issues, we're mindful about uh, the part of the country we live in. So this is our raw material. We are primarily recyclers of PET bottles. I think probably 90% of what we collect originates uh, on a landfill. The main site in Joburg is doing north of a 4 million bottles a day uh, to have the risk that in that stream could be bottles made from biodegradable additives or naturally based poses real problems to recyclers because in essence it's a contaminant. Uh, one example of what we do with the bottles is we in Cape Town convert it into a fiber and that fiber has some pretty stringent industrial applications for filtration road building, automotive. And the last thing you want is for that product to be disintegrating uh, because some biodegradable bottles got into our waste stream. So a question I get asked quite often is, can we recycle ourselves to sustainability? Um, I don't think I have the full and clear answer yet, but I am clear that where we add complexity to packaging uh, and it starts with design, uh, the inclusion of biodegradable packaging, if not properly managed, uh, threatens a recycling stream, uh, which we need to get ourselves to full sustainability. And again, the definition of sustainability varies depending on who you are asking. It's the property of being environmentally sustainable, the degree to which a process or enterprise is able to be maintained or continued while avoiding the long-term depletion of natural resources. And this is one of the areas where biodegradable has a challenge. From the standpoint that anything that's manufactured needs energy to make it. So one of the questions often asked about uh, biodegradables is why are we making products to literally evaporate uh, into air? 
the energy is in a global short supply. Uh, we really need to be uh, you know, designing our products so that we can harvest them to become the next product. Why is that important? Uh, for those of you who know, uh, this is what's known as the global overshoot day. It's calculated on the metric of what does it take the planet one year to cultivate and how quickly do we use it? And back in uh, 2019, uh, that day came on July the 26th. What it meant in essence is every day after that, we were now eating from the reserves of future generations. And that's when you start to hear metrics about, we now need one and a half planets to sustain the way we're consuming. And that's obviously not sustainable. Interestingly enough, in that year, South Africa hit its overshoot day on July the 8th. So a lot of this is now asking us to rethink how resources are managed uh, to try and get back to a point. Interestingly enough, the last time the earth consumed what it takes one year to produce was actually back in 1970, over 50 years ago. So if we're not mindful about how we use our resources, we'll quickly run out. And this is what's giving fuel to this whole thing about the circular economy. Design products to have an afterlife, ideally to become what they were before. A little bit of a thing on where we are um, in terms of South African context. Uh, when it comes to packaging, last year we collected 1.8 million tons. Of that 320,000 tons was plastic packaging. If you look at the percentages on the right, 37% uh, uh, while it seems low uh, is really up there with some of the best in the world. Uh, and we have some unique packaging streams like PET uh, bottles, which have crossed 60%. So to compromise that by introducing biodegradable packaging seriously threatens um, our ability to get us to uh, that 100% point. This is what's estimated to be consumed going forward. Uh, this year we estimate we'll be consuming about 3.6 million tons of packaging of which close to 900,000 tons is plastics, and you'll see that's growing. So the challenge is really on, not only to grow recycling from the base we had, but to keep up with uh, growing. Now, what it means equally is there's obviously products in there, whether it's made from plastic or paper or metal or glass, that for some reason or the other, never get collected for recycling. So to look at where perhaps biodegradable has a place, in our metrics uh, is important because it could serve some value, but boy, must we, must we be careful about not polluting and contaminating existing, existing recycling streams. So we want collection rates to cross 2 million tons. Uh, we're kind of hoping by 2025 on the plastic side, we'll be collecting close to half a million tons as a country. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the waste stream and the quality that comes in. So once again, the importance of not allowing biodegradable packaging to leak into our system uh, becomes critical. And on the back of that, uh, a lot of the global FMCG companies uh, under pressure from consumers and governments, uh, I have now some pretty ambitious one. Uh, it's either to include recycled content uh, at a growing rate, uh, as well as making packaging from bio-sourced material. So again, I stress this is not biodegradable. Uh, a lot of these companies like the Coca-Colas of the world do not subscribe to biodegradable packaging, <clears throat> excuse me, purely because it acts as a contaminant to existing recycling streams. But the ambitions of growing recycled content in packaging can only happen if we design our packaging to be recyclable in the beginning. So already in South Africa, we have bottles that are made from 100% recycled content. Uh, this has now been in the market two years. So I think in the true definition of circularity, we have demonstrated that we can take a bottle and turn it into the next bottle. And what are we learning? We're really, really learning that if we want to have an effect positively on environmental impact, 80% of that is influenced during the design phase. And biodegradables and compostables, in many instances, go against that. So while I did say it has a place to land, and we've got to be clever about how we do that, 
Equally, in many instances, it compromises us being able to get to those elevated rates. And it's been around for quite a while. Uh, you know, a study done almost 15 years ago found that 86% felt if packaging, it would be good if packaging contained recycled plastics uh, as opposed to being biodegradable. And again, in terms of context as well, a lot of the narrative about the plastics in the ocean, uh, really a lot of the plastics in the ocean are fishing nets more than packaging. Not that we give packaging a get out of field J card, uh, but we've really got to be mindful about keeping our focus on what the real challenges are. Uh, also a lot of attention now on fast fashion, which obviously use synthetics uh, to make their products. Uh, what happens to those at end of life? It could be in some instances that this is a good place to look at uh, biodegradables. Um, a lot of fiber made from plastic bottles ends up in products like diapers. I'm not aware of any diapers being collected anywhere in the world. Uh, maybe that's a good place for the biodegradables to be landing uh, their uh, products. And again, obviously uh, a new thing now is governments are starting to get involved in this space. It's looking at how they can use uh, taxes and levies uh, to influence consumer behavior uh, in all sectors of society. Uh, it's a bit like speeding fines. You know, it's, we'll all speed on the highway, but the minute we know there's a camera coming up because of that financial penalty, somehow you now start influencing behavior. What's interesting about uh, the legislation in South Africa was that the, they talk about the size of the levy needs to be related directly to the environmental damage. And what it also did, which was very unique, was that it also included uh, biodegradable pass packaging. So it's got a definition for biodegradable products. It means products that degrade by biological activity, resulting in a specific change in the chemical structure of the material. Degradation can occur under aerobic or anaerobic conditions. The end products are gas. I've highlighted carbon dioxide and methane because in the context of the bigger issue of today of climate change, one of the unknowns commonly about biodegradables is what happens to it when it biodegrades. And as I'll allude to later on, the last thing we want to be adding into our environment is more CO2 and more methane. Methane, I think, is 20 times more potent than CO2. But in the legislation, um, products that are claiming to be biodegradable and compostable also have to adhere to recovery and recycling standards. Uh, they have to demonstrate that uh, they've reached collection targets over five years, starting at 15%, going to 80%. Uh, it's got to be demonstrated to be recycled. One of the problems of recycling biodegradables is it's literally disintegrating in front of you. So how do you make a product from it? Uh, but equally, what we like about this inclusion is it doesn't allow any greenwashing to happen because anyone claiming uh, that their products are biodegradable and are not, uh, they too have to adhere to the same standards as all packaging. And it's getting loud out there. And on the back of this volume, the narrative and the imagery is quite stark. But what it's doing is it's uh, giving an opportunity in some instances to bad faith actors to sell us products that are supposedly biodegradable and a better solution for us at the end of the day. Well, how long does it take to biodegrade? It still has to go through a waste cycle uh, before it gets to that point. And in some instances, some biodegradable packaging items have been found to take as long as their conventional counterparts. Funny enough, the statistics of the ocean having more plastic than fish by 2050 had to be retracted because it was based on flawed science. But it doesn't stop the narrative uh, creating almost a fear uh, amongst us all and driving a negative plastic sentiment, uh, not realizing that plastics really evolved to make packaging more environmentally friendly. It has a lower carbon footprint, but sadly, obviously, uh, we've also designed some really poor plastic packaging 
which has left a very visible scourge. And I think that's what's driven a lot of the narrative around it. So obviously around it, we know the hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle. We're starting to see with the millennials and Generation Z, this whole culture of refuse, you know, if a product cannot demonstrate uh, to its credentials that it's recyclable or made from recycled or even truly biodegradable, then consumers are shunning it. So in conclusions, there is a role for biodegradables, but we mustn't allow it to come into existing recycling streams, which have taken decades to evolve. Uh, it's, it's almost like taking off the bottom rung uh, of the ladder and have uh, everything collapse, uh, almost like a domino effect if we do that. I think we need to ask and challenge those making claims around biodegradables. Does it really work? especially in our conditions. You need certain moisture levels, you need certain temperature levels. Otherwise, as I alluded to, it's not truly biodegradable. What's the net benefit? If we're designing products to disappear, as I also mentioned earlier, we've lost that ability to harvest the inherent energy that was in the product to go make the next product. So a bottle that can be designed to be recycled to the next bottle ensures we don't need to be sucking out more fossil fuels. But if we're designing bottles or products to degrade while emitting gases that we can't afford to have in the environment, then we've actually probably done more harm than good when looking at the net benefit to the environment. As I said, uh, things don't just disappear into nothing. Even when they biodegrade their emissions, uh, and as I'll show you now, this is something we can ill afford today. And the last one, uh, which is really important, what's the cost? Uh, in many instances, if you take the plastic straw, for example, you could be paying potentially double or triple what the conventional uh, plastic straw costed before. Now, for me, the solution to the plastic straw was actually no straw, but I'm sure all of us have come across plant-based, compostable, supposedly, and also recyclable, uh, but what's the cost to the consumer for that? And while there is motivation in paying a little more for those that have good environmental credentials, at a certain point, if it's become too expensive, then uh, did we really make it a sustainable product? And sorry, one more, uh, something else they're starting to find out is a perception amongst consumers that where they believe something is degradable, then you need not put it in the right recycling street. Just throw it away into the environment and it will just take care of itself. And if there's one challenge around all our environmental issues and not just plastic, it's behavior. So biodegradables sometimes enables the continuation of bad behavior. So this is probably the burning issue of today. I'm sure we're all tuned in to what's happening in Glasgow since last week at COP26 on matters of the environment. We're a growing population. A growing population needs to be fed, clothed, housed, transported, entertained. That means we're gonna have more packaging, not less packaging. Uh, if we're not mindful about how we design that, then the reality is either we lose its value or we create more pollution in our environment. And more than half of that population growth is gonna happen on our continent. So we're really invested in this. Ultimately, our actions are the real truth. Uh, that was an image from Glastonbury where David Attenborough, Sir David gave a, uh, a compelling speech about the environmental decay that was happening around him. And at the end of it, they just all left behind a squalid mess, making a mockery of their eco posturing. I think it's great to waive our objections and be vocal about it. But if we're not changing our behavior, then what are we really changing? And this is the burning issue of today. I think the last time we had the CO2 levels on planet Earth was 4 million years ago. Let me repeat that, 4 million years ago. Uh, we cannot be afford, we cannot afford to be adding more CO2 or methane into our environment. One of the virtues of PET that they found in other jurisdictions uh, is a study they did in the UK on the plant that we have over here shows that on average for every ton of bottles you recycle back to a bottle, 
and you're truly circular, there's a net saving of one and a half tons. So while biodegradables potentially create less pollution over time, they do add CO2 and methane emissions, unlike circular solutions, which actually result in net savings of CO2. So how did we do last year? Well, courtesy of the pandemic and being on lockdown, what was uh, July the 26th back in 2019, the overshoot day moved out to August in the right direction. But sadly this year, as we're getting back to business as usual, world overshoot day was on July 29th. So the reality is we are still consuming at a rate that this planet cannot recultivate. So that's my uh, take on this. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, there's a little video, if time permits, that I think will add a little more information and balance to the issue on biodegradables. Uh, and on that, I'll hand it over to Tara. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I'm just going to pull up the video now quickly. And then in the meantime, your, um, all our attendees are welcome to send through their questions, which we'll address just after this video. Uh, let's just share the sound as well. Um, here we go. This is supposed to be the plastic of the future. Ooh. Obviously not specifically this because it looks like crap. Ooh. This, this, this. And this. this is supposed to be the plastic of the future. Looks like normal plastic, feels like normal plastic, acts like normal plastic, but is made from plants. It pollutes less than conventional petrol-based plastics and in some cases is even biodegradable. Perfect, right? Plastic pollution problem solved. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. Bad. So bioplastics, you may have seen them in form of biodegradable plastics, like this coffee capsule or cutlery, but not all bioplastics are biodegradable. Bioplastics are called that because they're bio-based, meaning they derive from biomass like sugarcane, potatoes or cassava, instead of petroleum. Big companies like Coca-Cola and Danone have already started using bio-PET bottles. They're functionally identical and indistinguishable from petroleum-based PET. One of these bottles is bio-based, one is petroleum-based, and there's no way I can tell the difference. Currently, bioplastics only make up about 1% of all plastics, but the market is growing. The demand far exceeds the entire industry's ability to supply right now. This is Leah Ford. She works for one of the world's biggest bioplastics manufacturers, NatureWorks. Companies like NatureWorks are growing in large part thanks to consumers like us wanting more eco-friendly products. And compared to petrochemical-based plastics, it can be two-thirds to three-quarters less carbon per pound at the factory gate. This can vary depending on how, where, and of what they're made. But in general, bioplastics production emits less greenhouse gases, making them theoretically a more eco-friendly alternative. But more on that later. First, how the hell did this become this? So what you need is regular vinegar, water, potato starch, and glycerol. Let's get cooking. The heat in the vinegar help dissolve the starch. The glycerol, which is an alcohol, makes it easier to mold the mixture. Take a sheet of aluminium foil. And then you're supposed to kind of Ooh, I want to make a plastic wrap out of this and that's why I'm spreading it as thinly as possible. Fun, fun, fun. This needs to be cooled for 24 hours, so I made this batch yesterday. But as you can see, it's, it's just stuck. I'm going to have to try and peel this off. Ah! Oh my god. Yes. Ta-da! Easy peasy bioplastic. Now this looks like shit. I know, but 
It has the properties of a plastic. It's translucent, it's formable. The store-bought ones have more sophisticated production methods. But this is how a potato becomes a plastic. Now, making plastic out of biomass isn't a new idea. One of the earliest man-made plastics was a bioplastic called parxin, known today as celluloid, which derives from cellulose, found in plants. Ford even produced a soybean car, partly made out of, you guessed it, soybean-derived bioplastics. But eventually, petrol-based plastics took over. They were easier to produce and more versatile, and that demand only kept on growing. However, bioplastics are experiencing a comeback, and production is projected to grow significantly in the next years. But let's get into the tricky bit about bioplastics. Just because a plastic is bio-based doesn't necessarily mean it turns back into soil. The biodegradability comes from the chemistry of the materials. You can produce materials uh, from renewable resources. Either they can be biodegradable or they can be non-degradable, similar to your fossil-based plastics. This is Ramesh Padamati, a chemist who has studied the biodegradability of plastics. So let's talk about non-biodegradable plastics. Quick and easy chemistry explanation. This is ethylene, derived from petrol, which is formed into a long chain to become polyethylene, or PE. This carbon chain makes it stable and durable, but also really hard to break up, making it non-biodegradable. This is a bio-based material, in this case ethanol and alcohol. You can make the exact same structure, the exact same polyethylene, out of it. The leftover molecules become simple H2O, water. There are many different processes, but this is how a bio-based plastic can be non-biodegradable. Remember the video from the beginning? That was BioPET, also a non-biodegradable plastic. It acts just like petrol-based plastics, and just like them can clog up our oceans and accumulate in marine animals. Actually, about 45% of bioplastics produced today are not biodegradable. Okay, so let's talk about the biodegradable plastic. For example, this plastic, which is polylactic acid. It's designed so that it can almost entirely degrade into CO2 and water, similar to other biodegradable plastics. Like this. This is made out of polylactic acid and it says compostable. Compostable means that it biodegrades in a specific amount of time in a specific condition. With this, it's three months in an industrial composting facility. You need to collect them and you need to send it to composting, then only it will degrade. Okay, if you don't uh, collect and uh, you just think and uh, throw in the environment and uh, let's see whether it will degrade. No, it won't degrade. It will create the same problem of your fossil-based plastics. These industrial composting facilities, depending on where you live, are few and far between. And many don't even take compostable plastics because they are so hard to distinguish from conventional ones. On top of all of this, the plants that are grown for bioplastics can have a big land, water and carbon footprint, diverting crops away from food sources and harming the environment with pesticides. Some bioplastics companies are working towards growing and using local sustainable crops or producing plastic from bio-waste instead. But... The consumer doesn't necessarily know where it's produced, what were the inputs, and there are different bioplastics. So it's really hard to dump it on the consumer. This is Klaus Hubacek. He co-authored a study that looked at the land, water and carbon footprints of bioplastics. We found that uh, you couldn't easily replace all the, the plastic, even just throw away one-time use plastic because the, the requirements in terms of land use and water consumption would be so enormous. They calculated that to replace all plastic packaging with bioplastics, we'd need more than half of the world's corn production. <sighs> I know, it just, it's sad. It's sad, but it's true. That doesn't mean that using bioplastics never makes sense. There are a few applications where it would be better to switch from petrol-based plastics. Number one being food-related plastics. 
For example, this tea bag that can contain plastic, these coffee capsules or food packaging in general. Because packaging that yeah, has food waste inside of it or has touched food waste does not get recycled. So the only and the best way to handle that type of product is through composting. So replacing all of these conventional plastics with easily biodegradable, for example, home compostable bioplastics could be a good idea. Other examples are foils for agricultural use that can be plowed under the ground, or fishing equipment, which reportedly makes up 10% of all marine litter. But replacing all petrol-based plastics with bioplastics is just not realistic, and to be honest, downright unnecessary. One study estimates 40% of plastic produced is packaging, a lot of which is avoidable. In detail, there is no silver bullet really to it. The, the silver bullet is to avoid it, right? <laughs> I know it's hard sometimes. I know it's less convenient sometimes. I mess up all the time. Bioplastics can be better than conventional plastics, but it has its costs. It is not the perfect solution. The only way to curb plastic pollution is to use less of it, whether bio-based or not. If you like videos like this, subscribe to our channel. We post videos every Friday. All right. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for, for joining us today. Um, we're now going to move on to the Q&A section. Um, so you're welcome to send those comments through in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, for now, Sean Drew, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate a little bit in your experience with mechanical recycling. Have bioplastics contaminated recycling streams in the past? And what was the impact that it had? So not in our instance. Uh, it had biodegradable hasn't really entered the bottle space. Uh, but one industry that did have a problem was uh, film recycling. Uh, many years ago, some people might remember Tiger Brands uh, launched an Albany bread bag for their bread, which uh, was biodegradable. And that caused all sorts of complications. I think about two years later, they finally uh, tired of the backlash from consumers and the recycling fraternity and went back to uh, a proper plastic bag that was then recyclable. The risk is though that this negative pushbacks against single use plastics is kind of laying the land for someone to think that a biodegradable bottle is a good idea and it really isn't. Because the reality is if it penetrates or gets into your stream, it's a bit like, imagine putting a white shirt in the washing machine with a pen in your top pocket. You're just going to bleed and ruin the, the whole batch. Uh, thanks, Chandru. And then in your sort of work with the informal market, because um, particularly in South Africa, there's quite an informal market um, related to recycling. Uh, how would sort of, can you elaborate on the impact that biodegradable and bio-based uh, products would have on, on that sector? So informal collectors, you know, have a lot of challenges already. Um, at the end of the day, they pick up what they think has value, but ultimately the economics of recycling or any business for that matter is if they end up taking stuff to a collector who, when he sells it on to a recycler has been told, sorry, you can't touch that. Or he picked up something thinking it was compostable and the composting center said, no, actually, we don't want to touch it. He's now wasted a lot of time and energy picking up something that doesn't have value. So it really filters down the value chain because ultimately it has no value uh, from a recycling perspective. It's literally destined to disappear, uh, which sadly many a times it doesn't even do that, as you heard in the video. Uh, thanks. And then uh, obviously, uh you're sort of more in the mechanical recycling sector, correct? Okay, and then in, in terms of mechanical and also chemical recycling, um, what would you say is the time frame before, uh, or if it's possible, for biodegradable and bio-based plastics to, to be sort of um, available to go through the sort of chemical recycling in order to sort of form part of the circular economy? Or in your opinion, would you say that any sort of biodegradable products are sort of destined to not be circular so just to clarify bio-based is fine 
uh, as long as you're ending up as the same polymer that you were. Uh, the minute you're biodegradable, whether you're going into a mechanical system or a chemical system, it's the same problem because eventually you'll make a resin from it to go make a product, but that product is actively breaking down uh, unknown to the naked eye. And eventually your product will fail and your customer is going to be very irate, as will the consumer. Uh, I mean, the analogy is suddenly we'll have leaky bottles on our shelves and nobody wants that. Of and course. it makes no difference whether it's mechanical or a chemical process. I see. And the addition of sort of plasticizers or stabilizers, would they sort of be applicable or would they defeat the purpose? So, I mean, those in themselves are potential pollutants to a recycling stream. So to add one to negate another probably is just exasperating uh, the situation. Uh, really course. today, I think what more and more brand owners are realizing is keep it simple. The minute we start adding complexity to it, additives, multi-layers, funny colors, uh, that's where you're just pretty much designing it to fail. I see. Um, and very, very important to bear in mind sort of for consumers who are looking to make more environmentally conscious decisions. Um, then you referred, I noticed in your presentation, you referred to the reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and I know a lot of the other terminology that's associated with these is um, sort of the concepts of upcycling and downcycling. Um, and in your opinion, would you say that compostable or biodegradable plastic items would fall under downcycling? Uh, I think even worse, I think they would fall into no, no cycling uh, because what would happen very quickly, they would be identified and you'd find all the recyclers uh, would probably uh, put the word out, don't even pick up those products. So as alluded to in the video as well, you know, um, it'll end up in the environment. Not all of them work the way they're meant to work. Uh, and then you've actually done more harm than good. And the cherry on top, you had the privilege of paying more for it than the plastic alternative, which was probably recyclable. And I think, you know, these terminologies get so abused sometimes that even notions of upcycling and downcycling don't talk to circularity, you know? So it's a thing we're facing pressure on that some of our bottles are now going into garments. People are now asking the right question, saying, well done, you upcycled it to a garment, what's gonna to happen to the garment at the end of life? So I think people are becoming more, it has to be circular first. Uh, and that's only when you really, really can't, do you look at upcycling and downcycling options. Um, I, I agree. Um, <laughs> I, I think some people could argue that uh, products that are designed to be compostable or biodegradable that are perhaps bio-based, uh, if they are, composted in the correct facilities and then produce compost that that compost could then be used to grow more bio-based things. Um, so I think, I think there are some assumptions that that could be also a, taken as a circular model. Um, but in terms of resources and things like that, would you say that that is in fact circular or that the energy that goes into creating this product that's then composted doesn't, would you say that it is of equal or greater or lesser value than the compost itself? Well, it raises a very good point insofar as we many times get challenged is why can't bottles go back to glass? But you have to remind people that only 40% of glass actually currently gets recycled. So imagine you made the transition from PET to glass. All you've done is added to the pile. Now, equally with composting, we have so much organic waste out there. In fact, if you look at a landfill, its biggest space takers is stuff like construction, rubble, and organic waste. So we've got enough organic waste that could become compost. Why do we feel the need to go make packaging, to go make compost when we haven't even cleaned up the organic problem? So I think people should not just ask the question in isolation. They should be very mindful of the full uh, scenario in, in the space in which they live or trade. Certainly, and I think in in terms of a composting model, I wouldn't say that uh, it, it's necessarily commonplace, uh, certainly not at a sort of an established formal level um, for all of our waste to be sort of separated in general and then separated for compostability. Um, so certainly something to bear in mind. Um, kind of linking to that, um, <laughs> obviously with COP26 uh, happening and, and 
as it should be, the um, issue of CO2 emissions is quite relevant at the moment. Um, I know you mentioned this briefly in your presentation, but can you perhaps go into a little bit of detail as to why recycling um, offers a better alternative to um, reducing net carbon emissions than perhaps bio-based or biodegradable options? Sorry, not bio-based, biodegradable. So it links to that world overshoot day. There's only so many resources on the planet, whether we're using it to cultivate food or energy or products. Uh, even to make a biodegradable packaging product needs energy, needs transport, needs to be sold at, at some point. So every product has inherent energy in it. Uh, what we don't want to do is lose that because then we've got to go back and start again plunder from the earth, the resources that we no longer have access to. In essence, we're eating the food of the future um, and then causing more challenges for ourselves. So that's why this whole drive is, okay, design your product so that the energy that went into making it can somehow be harvested to become ideally what it was before. If not that, another product. And then at the very least, you know, incinerated to generate energy. But the notion of just making it disappear and emitting CO2 and methane as a result thereof is really overinflating the balloon, which I think is gonna pop probably, I guess more in your lifetime than mine. So sorry for that. Uh, but I think the science is very clear. The burning issue of today is climate. It's not plastic. Doesn't mean we give plastic a get out of jail card and not be observant about what they're doing, but I promise you it's not the burning issue of today. And certainly, and, and of course, in, in designing solutions, we don't want to create an inevitable future problem. So in terms of sort of resources and land availability, you also don't want habitat destruction to be a byproduct of a bio-based industry. Um, so I, I agree, a circular model is certainly <laughs> what we should be striving for. Um, and then I see we're nearly out of time, um, but you, I know you mentioned briefly in your presentation and it was came up in the uh, video as well. Uh, obviously, I think this sort of the, the wave of bio-based and biodegradable products um, it isn't necessarily going to evaporate. So I think it's important to, to obviously bear in mind which products sh are suitable to be biodegradable. I know you mentioned um, diapers and things like that. Um, would you recommend any other products? Um, uh, well suited to become biodegradable, such as sort of meat trays, um, food packaging, as they mentioned. So would that, uh, would that reduce the sort of, sorry, would that reduce the strain on um, sort of mechanical recycling that perhaps could be contaminated sort of with food, um, food waste on plastic products? So great question. Uh, recyclability starts with collectability. What do I mean by that? Some products are just so small or so light that they have no value. Um, that's where you might look at products like sachets for ketchup, mayonnaise, you know, those small products which capture a huge market presence. Uh, sometimes we might have to just take it on the chin and say, this stuff is never going to be picked up. Uh, why don't we make that then uh, biodegradable? Because it's the lesser of the other evil of leaving it out there for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. Uh, but there are many products in everyday life, many which we don't sue, see that are used for industrial applications in automotive, in bedding, in uh, uh, filtration, you know, that at end of life have only one way to go. And I think if you scale up and quantify globally how many diapers, uh, sanitary pads, you know, all of these products which just are destined for landfill. I think that's where biodegradable can play a key role without endangering mechanical recycling streams, which in their own right have to do better. So I think that's where some clever people have to get around the table and make those tough choices for industry. Certainly. Um, and I think it, it links back to your sort of reduced, re well, the, you know, the global reduced, reuse, recycle, and then so yeah, as far as possible to aim for recyclable or circular products um, when necessary. Um, and what and you then... don't want to do is obviously enable overconsumption, as was talked about in the video at the end. True mm -hmm. sustainability is about consumption. 
Mm. You know, and, we're buying and, stuff we just don't need. And the reality is it's ending up in, in, in the environment. Mm. Um, and, and always important to bear in mind that regardless of uh, whether it is degradable or recyclable, its place is not in the environment, <laughs> regardless of its product, of, of its Because um, of behavior, components. right? I mean, mm. the, the notion that it's gonna disappear doesn't really drive anyone to do the right thing. But that's why one of the key inclusions in South African legislation that became law Friday last week, it's incredible how many people still don't know it, uh, that they're gonna hold the biodegradable and compostable industry to the same standards. Otherwise, it's just greenwashing. You know, how do you know? Certainly, and, and I don't think, yes, obviously we don't want people uh, to be, consumers who are looking to make more environmentally conscious decisions are not the people who we want to sort of be taken advantage of with greenwashing campaigns and things like that. Correct, so. absolutely. Right. Um, all right, I see we've gone slightly over our 45 minute session, um, <laughs> but if anyone does have any questions for Chandru at a later stage, um, you're welcome to email us at uh, webinars at sccafrica.org.za or to email Chandru. I see he had his email address up at the end of his slides, um, but we'll happily pass those along. Uh, and then just from all of us uh, at SST, I'd just like to say thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and a special thank you to Chandru for taking the time to present for us this afternoon and to share your insights as, as a figure in the recycling industry in South Africa. My pleasure and thank you to everybody who participated. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.